In this video, we are going to establish um, some definitions for the forces that we're most commonly going to have to deal with. There are lots of ways of defining forces, and we need to be very particular here in the beginning. Most generically, a force is just a push or a pull. But in this video, we're going to define uh, specific forces that you know, we need to know and understand them when we see them or how to diagram them specifically. That'll be our next video, drawing these diagrams. But uh, it's very important that you correctly identify them by name because our equations are going to refer to specific forces. And if you were to label the force as something other than what we said it should be labeled as, you might find yourself shorthanded, not having enough information, you know, you're not making the, the proper connections. So this video is just going to be all about establishing um, a certain catalog of forces. So to begin, I want to say that we're going to categorize our forces into two groups. The one group is going to be the contact forces, and the other group is going to be the non-contact forces. Now the non-contact forces are actually very few. We don't have a lot of them. And so I'm going to start with the non-contact forces. And the non-contact forces are basically um, broken up into two other categories. And so we start with this general group of non-contact forces. And we have what we call the short range non-contact forces. And those are going to be the nuclear forces. Now, what did we say about the nuclear forces? We're not going to be working with them this year. So we basically can ignore those. The other category of non-contact forces are going to be the long-range non-contact forces. And when we say long-range, we mean basically it goes all the way out to infinity. Okay, and um, those are also going to be very few in number. And for the most part, there's only one that we're going to worry about until it's time to worry about the others. So the, the one that we're most interested in, these long-range non-contact forces, is going to be gravity. So gravity is the one that we're interested in. Now, if you're interested in knowing what the others are, and again, we're not, these should never come up on your radar in terms of doing um, physics problems in class or for this course, at least not at this point in time. The ones that should never come up on your radar would include the electric force and the magnetic force. I don't ever want to see those two forces show up or, or even come to mind at this point in time. We're talking about mechanics and not electricity. And they these two forces have no place in what it is that we're doing right now. Eventually we'll get there, but we're not there yet. Okay, so that's going to bring us to the contact forces. Now the fact that I emphasized gravity as the only non-contact force is going to be super important whenever we get to our next video when we're drawing diagrams. Let's focus on these contact forces. And when it comes to these contact forces, we have two that are very closely related to each other. And I'll explain what I mean by that uh, towards the end of the video. And so I'm going to actually make them stand out with two different or with one color that's going to be separate from the rest of the list. And so the first one that we have is uh, the normal force and the normal force is always the properties of the normal force or that it always acts perpendicular to the surface it's always going to be between two solids which touch if it's not two solid surfaces and they're not touching then we do not have a normal force but when we do have that touch, this force will always exist. The other force, which is going to be related to the normal force, 
is the friction force. And the friction force we write is a capital F sub italicized F. And we'll develop the friction force more in other videos because there's a lot more that can be said. But right now, the whole purpose of coming up with this catalog and describing these forces is because you need to know very specifically what the properties of each one of these forces are. This list that I'm giving you right now, you need to commit to memory and know it inside and out because it's going to get you out of trouble whenever you're trying to diagram, draw an FBD, set up a problem, and you know, you're looking at these forces like I think it exists or I know it exists, but I don't know which way it points. You know, there's a lot of variation in our problems. And if you know the definitions and you know the properties for each of the individual forces, at least nine out of ten times, you won't have any problems drawing an accurate diagram. And you're going to see that with my methodology and my style of approaching these force problems, that it's essential that you draw your FBD correctly. I mean, I think all physics teachers would say that, but, you know, I greatly emphasize the free body diagram uh, to my students. Certainly, when I was a student, sometimes I would draw them, sometimes I would just keep it all in my head and try to do everything from my head. And honestly, it created a lot of confusion, and it wasn't crystal clear what was going on. Um, by the time I'm done with you, it will always be crystal clear. And so you should be prepared to answer my question to you. And I'm going to do this a lot this year. And nobody is safe from the question. So always be prepared to answer this one. How do you know? Because I want to know how do you know. You're justifying your response. It's not just, oh, I got this feeling or because that's the way it is. There's a very definite reason for everything that we do. And so you have to tell me how do I know. And we'll work on that as we go throughout the course. Um, and you'll get real good at doing it. It's not as difficult or as bad as it sounds. Okay, so back to the friction force. Um, the, the friction force is actually kind of the opposite of the normal force. And that is that it's always parallel to the surface. And the friction force may exist, but it does not have to exist. It's not a requirement of a problem. We do many problems where we put an object on a frictionless surface for the sake of making it easier to understand the more fundamental physics that's going on, the bigger principles. And then as time goes by, we start to include these more complicating factors, and that's how we learn. You start simple, you boil it down to the easiest thing possible, and you progressively add more and more stuff to what it is that you're doing. So the friction force may exist. It's always going to act parallel to the surface, and that's all we're going to say about it for now. Then we have the tension force. And the tension force, we use F sub capital T. And the tension force exists in strings or ropes or chains, uh, those things which cannot be put under compression. So if you try to squish something together, it's under what we call compression. And if you take something and you try to pull it apart, it's under tension. And you can do that with I don't know, your calculator. Just put one hand on each side of the calculator and try to push your two hands together. You've now put your calculator under compression. And then if you hold on to it and you try to separate your hands, you have now put the calculator under tension. So when it comes to strings, it should be obvious that you can never put a string under compression. It only works in one direction. And so the tension force has these properties. The tension force is the same everywhere in the rope. The tension force always points away from the object, and that's the part where you can't put it under compression. 
And this is another biggie, kind of obvious, but sometimes it's not always so obvious when you're in the middle of trying to do a problem and maybe you're starting to hit the panic button, okay? Um, and that is that it's always parallel to the string. So now let's take a look at our next force. The next force is the drag force, and we'll denote that with an F sub capital D. And the drag force is not something that we look at in a lot of detail like we would in AP Physics C. Um, the drag force is a very complex force, and the drag force um, in our class will be treated in a very simple manner. So you might get a question where we talk about the average drag force, but that's about it. Okay, so um, I'm not going to describe the drag force any more than that in terms of the mathematics, but it does show up, you know, it, and, and when we talk about the drag force, we're looking at air resistance, or it could be some type of fluid, other fluid resistance. So we'll say the most common ways of looking at is air resistance and water resistance. If a speedboat is moving through water, it's going to feel a backwards force pushing on it, and that's still the drag force. Okay, now the drag force, I want you to know this because it's just fundamental physics principles, but the drag force is caused by microscopic collisions. And as you might be able to guess, the faster you're moving, the faster these collisions occur, the more collisions you have in the same amount of time, and that's going to increase the amount of force that you experience. Um, but it is due to microscopic touches, which is why it's in the category of a contact force and not a non-contact force, because we have atoms and molecules which are colliding, which are producing this larger drag force. And so we take millions and billions of microscopic collisions and lump them together into one collision that we call drag. Our next force is going to be the buoyant force, and that will be F sub B. And the buoyant force is similar to the normal force. Okay, and the buoyant force, it always points to the surface. Okay, and the buoyant force is going to um, basically be when, a, when you're in a fluid, when an object is in a fluid. Now, it could be something like, let's say that we have a watery surface here, and it could be something like there is a gold chest which is resting on the bottom of the ocean. The buoyant force is going to be pointing straight up. It could also be that there is a beach ball or some other ball which is floating on the surface. And this is where it really starts to look like the normal force, but it's going to feel a force which is pointing straight up, unless it's in the middle of coming down a wave and then it would be perpendicular to the surface. Okay, so the buoyant force is going to be similar to but uh, the normal force, but we're never really going to treat it that way. But in case anybody had questions about it, yeah, the buoyant force, um, if you're on the surface, it's going to end up behaving more like the normal force. But we're going to assume in a class like this that the surface is perfectly flat and therefore the buoyant force is still going to be pointing straight up. We're going to learn how to draw these diagrams in the next video. Now the last force that I want to mention is the F sub box. All right, And what I mean by that is this. There are lots of forces that we come across which are just, you know, we don't really have a specific term for it, um, or we do have a specific term, but it might end up adding confusion to the problem. Examples of this type of force would include the force of thrust. 
okay, out of, say, a rocket engine or a jet engine. It could be that you're driving your car up a hill and you want to say it's the force of the engine. Or somebody's pushing a box and you say the force of the push. Now, there's very good reasons why you would want to use this conceptual language instead of what we're really talking about. You know, in the example of the push, this is technically a normal force. The force of the engine is technically a friction force between the tires and the road. And that just adds a lot of confusion to the you know, problem solving process. So in many cases, and even in your textbook, right, when you're reading through the questions, they'll describe forces as the force of the engine, the force of the push, the force of this, the force of that. So feel free to use just this generic labeling system liberally, provided that the forces that we're looking at are not one of these forces up here that we've defined. In particular, the, the ones that you have to be most careful with are the normal force, the friction force, and the tension force. Those three, those are huge, okay? Um, you've got to identify those properly. Now, we talked about the generic force, and you might say the force of the ground generically. Here's the problem with doing that. Okay, um, the, en any surface or any two surfaces that come into contact, right? Because it always takes two. But on the surface where there's contact, you always have the possibility of producing two different but related forces. And now I'm going to show you the relationship between those two forces. So let's take this idea and over here in this empty space I'm going to be working and let's say we have a box which is sitting on a ramp the box itself is not sliding and you know from life experience that if that ramp were icy that that box would slide to the bottom of the ramp readily okay um, but it's not sliding so what that tells us is that first of all we look at this and we say how many touches do we have we can see, well, there's one touch, and that's the box and the ramp. So the box is going to have a force which points perpendicular to the surface, and we would call that one the normal force. Because it's not sliding, and we know that it should be sliding, that means there's going to have to be a friction force which is pointing up the ramp. Now, those two forces are kind of unique in their identification because they're at right angles to each other. And that's important. We know that they have to be at right angles if they're not going to interfere with each other. But here's the thing. If you were to just generically label um, the normal force or the friction force as the force of the ground, you would be incorrect because the force of the ground acting on the box is a combination of these two forces. And so remember that with our head-to-tail diagrams that the friction force, if we put it head-to-tail with the normal force, that's going to give us this one combined force. I, I guess I could call it a combined force, um, which looks like this. So that is the force of the ground, or in this case, the force of the ramp. Okay, The force of the ramp is not perpendicular to the ramp, and it's not parallel to the ramp. It is up and to the left of the ramp, and it's composed of a perpendicular component we call the normal force and a parallel component we call the friction force. So the force of the ramp is actually a combination of forces. Now, if this was a frictionless ramp, let's draw another one right here. And here's our box on the ramp. If this was a frictionless ramp, then we would only have one of the two forces, normal and friction, right? Only the normal force would exist. And that also means the force exerted by the ramp on the box is in the same direction as well. And so we would also have the force of the ramp right there. Okay, so that's why we have to be careful with how we label our forces. So anytime it's a force which is perpendicular to the surface, we must label it normal. 
Anytime we have a force which is parallel to the surface and it's the result of the surface being rough, then we know we have to label it the friction force. Okay, so in our next video, we are going to take a look at how we draw uh, free body diagrams, which are going to be the key to being successful at solving force problems.